So I have, a, I have three points that I want to touch on here. All right, I love it. Specifically to the Glucose Goddess one, I made a video on her on my channel, Mike Dave YouTube, and I basically pointed out that she doesn't even read the studies that she cites. So she's like citing a bunch of studies for different things, and then she's not reading what the outcomes are and what, what's going on, and she's making like clear errors. And even when she's comparing things, like she compares orange juice to pure glucose or to Coke, it's non-comparable in many different ways besides the fact that the sugar content is the same. So it's basically a fallacious straw man argument to say, oh, they're exactly the same. She's doing things like this, but I think it's a marketing ploy largely because it speaks to people that, that are like, well, I don't really have to change the foods that I really like these processed foods. I just need to have less sugar. So people want this really simplified basic answer. And she's trying to speak to that, but that's, if you want outcomes, if you really want to improve your health, if you want to put out the fires, that is not like managing blood glucose is but one strategy in an entire toolkit of strategies. And if you want to throw all your eggs in just a one strategy <laughs> like basis, it's a pretty like your outcomes are really I don't think are going to be that great overall. Not that blood glucose management isn't important. It is. But it's just like to just throw it on this idea that, yeah, I just eat less sugar and I manage my blood glucose and like I can still eat all these foods that I don't want to as long as I manage or that are not good for me. That as long as I manage this and that is like that's not going to get people long term outcomes. And I, I know this because I work with people regularly. So I think there's like I think it's important, like the value she brings is talking about blood sugar, but then everything, a lot of the other things after that are really questionable from a health basis, especially if you, like, I read the studies, I've like looked at some of her, vi her videos, Me too. And I'm reading the studies that she's citing and I'm going through them. Like, I don't know what this lady's talking about in some of these places. So that's a big one. The next one I want to talk about is that I do have a guide on my website. It's called the nutrition blueprint where it runs down how to set up your diet. It's free. It's a video course and PDF that tells you how to structure out your diet. And so something to keep in mind with dietary structure is you want to know your needs, your caloric needs, so that you're not massively overeating, you're not massively undereating. But again, that is one strategy. So you know your, what your caloric requirements are, but then you need to know what protein you need, how much carbs you need, how much fat you need, what sources of foods work for your body that you want to use to hit those targets. And then are you hitting your micronutrients? And then maybe you, maybe you take a liver capsule to cover some of those micronutrients. Maybe you take vitamin D to cover some micronutrients or go out in the sun and things like this. So it's, there's a multi-tiered approach to managing the diet that's not just calories and it's not just blood glucose regulation. It's multiple steps to get things right. And there are specific targets to do this so that it is not ambiguous. And that's extremely important to, to get those right. This is what I'm doing with people. That's why I made that guide is to help people organize these things in a step-by-step -step fashion to get these things right because they make a massive difference. I mean, I have, I have clients I'm working with. I have one guy, he's, he, we started out about 300 pounds on, on hundreds of units of insulin a day. And he's done all the doctors, he's, he's, he's done all the alternative practices and we changed his diet around. And now we're hundred pounds down. We're on one quarter of the amount of insulin he's using. His lipid profile moves into range that's not atherogenic anymore. Testosterone increases. And so you see these changes from diet alone. We have supplements on board, but most of that was from diet because he was already supplementing out the wazoo from listening to all the podcasts and listening to all these influencers, but his diet wasn't right. And so once you get those things right, and the spoiler alert, it was his diet is like steak, potatoes, fruit, and then I think he has some type of cooked vegetables in there or some type of vegetable, and then some type of soup with, with some types of legumes because he liked it. That's fine. All of those things were fine. Whole foods diet, plant foods, animal foods. And again, like massive change in his outcomes. And he was on all the medications. <laughs> like He's on multiple medications. So I think it's really, I can't hammer home enough how important that dietary stuff is, Paul. I want to reiterate that because I think you're 100% correct about that. And I want to let people know that there are those multiple tiers to correct. The last piece that I want to bring in here is I want to bring back to the PUFA that you were talking about. And there's a great article uh, It's called Omega-6 Vegetable Oils as a Driver of Coronary Heart Disease. It's by James D. Nic D, D. Nicolantonio and James uh, O'Keefe. And basically, they have a rundown in this article talking about how linoleic acid is directly implicated in cardiovascular disease. And they have basically 21 points that obliterate a linoleic acid as, as like one of the of, of primary promoters. And what they say here, I'm going to read a couple of them. 
They say greater amounts of linoleic acid oxidation products are found in LDL and plasma of patients with atherosclerosis. So they have, a, they have oxidized LDL in higher amounts in people who have atherosclerosis. There's greater amounts of linoleic, linoleic acid oxidation products are found within atherosclerotic plaques, and the degree of oxidation determines the severity of atherosclerosis. So the more oxidized linoleic acid you have in the plaque, the worse the plaque. A diet higher in oleic acid or lower in linoleic acid decreases LDL's ability to ox uh, susceptibility to oxidation. So less linoleic acid in, in the LDL, less oxidation. Endothelial cells oxidize LDL, forming linoleic acid hydroperoxides. So when you're getting these oxidized LDL, it's usually from linoleic acid hydroperoxides or oxidized linoleic acid. Linoleic acid is the most abundant fatty acid in LDL, is an extremely vulnerable to oxidation, being one of the very first fatty acids to oxidize. So we know LDL is a polyunsaturated fat and can readily peroxidize under being exposed to fires, which we're seeing in the metabolic dysfunction. They say a meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials in humans found that when saturated fats plus trans fat is replaced with omega-6 fat high in linoleic acid, there is an increased an increase in all-cause mortality, ischemic heart disease, and morta ischemic heart disease mortality and cardiovascular mortality. And then the last one I'll read here is that the oxidation of, of linoleic acid and LDL leads to conjugated dienes, which can covalently bind to ApoB, alterating its structure, creating oxidized LDL. Oxidized LDL is no longer recognized by the LDL receptor on the liver, but scavenger receptors on macrophages, causing monocyte infiltration into the subendothelium, bone cell formation, and eventually atherosclerosis. So the, when you get L linoleic acid in the LDL particle and it oxidizes, it damaged the ApoB, which is the protein in the LDL particle. And that is one of the key initiating steps driving the, the act activation of the endothelial cells and also the immune activation. So there's multiple pieces of evidence there implicating seed oils in cardiovascular disease. And just to tag on to this, if you look at the trends in cardiovascular disease, cardiovascular disease started ramping up until about the 1950s and 60s because people were smoking a ridiculous amount. And then when the smoking calmed down with all the ads and litigation, all the stuff that went on during the 50s and 60s, somewhere around that time frame, cardiovascular disease starts to taper off. But what happens is then we start to implement seed oils around this time. And what do you know? The trend of cardiovascular disease worsens with diabetes and obesity. And now researchers are like, hmm, we don't really know why we're getting all of this cardiovascular disease. And then it's like, well, if you start to look at the trends, not with carbohydrate consumption, not with sugar consumption, but with, car with seed oil consumption, omega-6 polyunsaturated fatty acids, soybean oil, canola oil, margarine, uh, these types of things, what you start to see is, oh, wow, there seems to be some type of relationship with, with these disease processes and metabolic dysfunction and these, these seed oils. And so you, there's, we're seeing some of these trends play out and we, see, we have these relationships. And so the seed oil piece is a huge thing and it's in every single food, almost every single food. You go to restaurants, they're cooking in seed oils. You eat packaged food, it's cooked in seed oils. And the, the worst thing is the seed oils in these foods are high temperature processed, which they're already damaged. Versus like people, are, oh, well, nuts and seeds have omega-6. It's like, okay, I don't think that's ideal long-term. But most people are really just sucking up heated polyunsaturated fats from processed foods, or even if you go out to a restaurant, they're rubbing your steak down in grapeseed oil or canola oil before they fry it. So these are things to keep in mind in terms of your exposure, because these are some of the major, I, at least in my perspective, from what I've read in the research, and I think we would agree here that this is one of the major components driving some of these problems. I completely agree. And yeah, thank you for hammering that home and pointing that out. I, I think that it's massive. And I'm just reminded that one of my um, vegan friends posted something yesterday on Instagram that my team sent me. And he said, the overwhelming majority of evidence shows that omega-6 linoleic acid is cardioprotective. And I thought, oh my God, we still have work to do. You know, I'm going to try and get him on the podcast for a debate. You know, and like I said, I'm going to try and debate Lane Norton on Peter Atia's podcast on seed oils. It's, it's kind of like the cholesterol literature. It's, it's confusing. And unless you read it carefully, you could be misled. 